Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March 20th, 2020 Austin P. State University Board of Trustees meeting in probably and hopefully what will be the most strange circumstances we will ever hold a meeting. Um, at this time, Secretary, please call the roll. In accordance with the TCA 844-108, Section C3, I have to ask two questions of you, if you could answer each of those for the record. That being, are you able to hear us clearly so that you can participate in this meeting? And also, are you able to identify any persons present in the room with you from those persons who are participating in this meeting? So as I call your name for the role, if you'll just answer those two questions for me. Trustee Atkins. Yes. Trustee Kanata. Yes and yes. Trustee Carroll. Yes and yes. Trustee Jenkins. Yes and yes. Trustee Luck. Yes and yes. Trustee May. Trustee May. Trustee May. Yes. Trustee McAllister Brooks. Yes and yes. Trustee Mueller. Yes and yes. Trustee O'Malley. Yes and yes. Trustee Wadia. Yes and yes. Chairman, I do not detect a fiscal quorum present. However, a quorum does exist by the inclusion of those members participating by electronic means. In accordance with TCA 844-108, Section B2, I would offer up to the committee the following circumstances which necessitate the reason for holding this meeting. Effective March 12, 2020, Austin P. State University began operating in a limited capacity, suspending on-ground classes due to the spread of the coronavirus. The administration made the determination to limit large gatherings of individuals, such as this board meeting, in order to protect the health and safety of participants. Chairman, I ask that a motion be made and a roll call vote be taken for a determination on the necessity of holding this meeting. An affirmative vote will signify that a necessity does exist for this meeting to proceed. A dissenting vote will signify that a necessity does not exist for this meeting to continue. So based on the information provided by Ms. Whiteside, I move that we determine that necessity has been established to hold this meeting in the absence of a physical quorum. Is there a second? Second. It is moved and seconded that necessity has been established to hold this meeting in the absence of a physical quorum. Any discussion? Hearing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Here. Trustee Kanata? Here. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Present. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Motion carries and we have a quorum. Thank you. Please note that there is an item on your agenda that needs to be adopted. Before I call for a vote, is there anyone who wishes to extract this item from the consent agenda? I move for the adoption of the agenda, including the consent agenda items. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Secretary. Please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia. Yes. Thank you. The motion is adopted. The minutes for the November 22nd, 2019 board meeting were circulated in advance of this meeting. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Motion to approve. Hearing. Thank you, Don. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I heard that from Don. Um, is there a second? A second. 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 Thank you. There's a second. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? 
Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. At Trustee this time, O'Malley, I'd like to recognize. Trustee yes. O'Malley, uh, let me just pause one moment. For the general audience members who are on the phone, if you will mute your phone, we've, we've been hearing that there is background noise. So please, for the members in the general audience who are on the general telephone number, please mute your phone. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White, who will introduce the individual who, who will provide us with a campus spotlight. Thank you, Chairman O'Malley. Thank you, uh, trustees, especially for your patience today as we handle business a little bit differently from usual. Uh, it is a privilege to introduce Dr. Eve Rice, who's the Interim Director for the School of Nursing and the Associate Professor in the Department. I'm very pleased not only with, with Dr. Rice's leadership, but also the leadership of, of that entire department. Um, I have heard many times since I have been living in Clarksville nearly six years that people can tell an Austin P nurse. If they go for care at a doctor's office or a clinic or a hospital, they very often know if they're getting care from an Austin P nurse because of the excellent program that we have here. And Dr. Rice is actually um, a graduate of our program. She graduated in 1997 with her bachelor's degree and then got a master's degree in maternal child health from Stony Brook, uh, is a pediatric nurse practitioner, and then has a doctorate in nursing that she earned in 2015. She studied asthma compliance in third and fourth grade students, and I'm thinking right now, uh, asthma compliance is probably at the top of everyone's list as we're dealing with this, uh, this virus. But she has a, a vast 23-year 23 nursing, nursing career, including working in the emergency room, neonatal, intensive care, and pediatrics. Um, that's really important, too, because our nurses have practical, real-world experience, and they put out nurses, they produce nurses who are graduating here and ready to work. I'm happy to say you'll hear this in a moment, but our nursing students took the NCLEX exam um, in, the, in, the, in the fall, in the last exam, we had a 100% pass rate, which is not a surprise to me at all, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Um, and so I'm really delighted that uh, Dr. Rice is joining us virtually, and I ask her to give you uh, some explanation of the good work that our School of Nursing is doing right now. Dr. Rice. Good morning. Can all y'all hear me okay? Yes. 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 Okay. So thank you for having me on for this spotlight, Dr. White. Um, I'm very excited to represent our school and our faculty and um, for this opportunity just to share some highlights and some stories of our students. So just, just to top it off before I start talking about the first slide, you all know and probably in your lifetime have had nurses that have taken care of you or your family members. <clears throat> and the six C's of nursing, there are six C's of the nurse nursing that I want to share with you. And I, as I go through these slides, I'm going to talk about how each of these students represent these six C's. Of course, number one is caring. Caring defines us in our work. There's compassion. It's how given through relationships based on empathy. There's, they have to be competent in all their caring roles and have the ability to understand each individual's health and their social needs. They're communicators um, and listeners. They are utmost courageous, especially in times like today's time, um, and they're committed. They're committed for patients to their populations and the cornerstone of what we do. So just, just, just to share a little bit about those things, and then I'll go on. The next slide, please. So I'm going to, before we hit Hunter's story, Hunter is a graduate from last year. He was one of my advisees. I love him to pieces. He used to come in my office all the time and sit and just need, um, me to tell him that he's going to do okay and he's going to pass. He's very timid um, and um, a little scared, but he's very bright. And, and of course he was to get in our program. So this past summer, he went and did a BSNP program at Vanderbilt Hospital. And that's just an internship for about six to eight weeks. And um, he won this award he's going to talk about called Credo. As soon as the summer was over, he ran um, back, when he came back to Austin, he came up to my office, and I didn't even know he'd gotten the award yet, and he sat in my office, and he said, Dr. Rice, you're never going to believe all those things you told me about being confident and how the knowledge I had and what I learned. He said, it all came together, and I won this award. So 
I want you to I want to share with you and for you to listen to what he had to say. So I'm Hunter Burkhart. I'm a senior nursing student here at Austin P. The Credo Award from Vanderbilt is given to a student nurse in each track. It's also given to students who show extreme care for their patients and the patients' families. Just being able to work with um, really sick and injured patients for a full seven weeks just gave me a ton of new skills. Really happy that I got it and uh, what the nurses had to say in the recommendations really kind of just put a huge smile on my face and gave me the confidence. That was about eight or nine. My dad had a heart attack and uh, we were at Vanderbilt for a few weeks while he recovered from that and then a year later he had a stroke and so we were back there. The nurses there that took care of us were really good and they would always check on the family, see if we need anything. It kind of just always brings me back to that moment when they would always ask if, you know, if I wanted a popsicle or something like that. You know, just something, you know, just small and not really that big of a deal. They can just run and get it. I mean, it would make my day, honestly. And so I want to try and do that to all my patients and their families. Just do the small things that can make their hospital stay even better. So every time I see that video, I get tears in my eyes because I'm so proud of that young man for um, just doing all that he did and winning that award. All right, next slide. So our program leadership is listed here. Of course, I'm Dr. Eve Rice, but Tina Shank is on the line listening today. Um, she's my assistant director of nursing, and we have three different faculty members, Dr. Tasha Ruffin, Dr. Deborah Wilson, and Dr. Michelle Robertson that are in charge of the different three different programs that um, makes up our school. We also have 24 full-time faculty members and over 30 adjuncts. And adjuncts basically are the um, part-time faculty that are in the trenches and the hospital settings that help us do all of our clinical rotations throughout the semester. Next slide. Real quick, a story about um, Crystal. Uh, she was a mom of four. She was on her second career. She just graduated this past year. And I tell you, the determination of her and the will to never give up blew me away. Um, as you teach these individuals throughout each semester, and I was fortunate enough to teach her in the pediatric class, you get to know them very well and they share their stories with you. And I'm so proud of her. She uh, went over many obstacles and it was tough, but she never quit. She persevered the entire time. And I just am so proud of her to see her in this um, picture today and know that she's out there getting great care as we speak probably. Next slide. All right, this is something kind of we're, we're proud of. Every semester of the past four years, we do a faculty um, student civility meeting in um, Clement Auditorium. We bring all of our students in and um, we talk about something called ground rules. Um, because civility is such a huge part of our society and every profession today, but it's very, very important, of course, in nursing because we deal with all different type of personalities and socioeconomic classes and not everybody is like everybody. And so we start that um, just while they're in school. They recite a civility pledge together and then they, they sign a pledge online in their D2L shell for each, through each course. And some of the ground rules we talk about are just assuming goodwill, respecting each other, building trust, following the chain of command, collaborating with others. And the next slide, if you'll go to the next slide, it shows a picture of our faculty. And this year we all wore Kindness Matters shirts and because that's what nursing's about, and that's what life's about is how we treat each other. And so we also gave the opportunity for all the um, students who would like one. We bought them one, and we have we're trying to hopefully next semester wear these in use in every month to show how much time this does matter within each other and with our patients. Um, and we also started. You saw the picture of the little rock. I, uh, my sons and I made these rocks, and we. Um, passed them out under their chairs on the civility day. They leaned forward and picked up a rock. And so throughout the semester, they are to catch each, to catch each other in acts of kindness and showing civility. Um, and just that's just another fun thing to do and just to show how they care about each other. And lastly, about civility, every month we also do a um, monthly spotlight downstairs. We have a student and a faculty member, and we show and have quotes that they've been shared from um, about their civility and what they've done for our school. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, a lady named Dr. Cindy Clark actually brought this to the forefront at our faculty retreat about four years ago, and we just hit the ground running and really um, embedded this in part of our um, 
uh, curriculum. So we're, we're happy to, we're very excited about it, and I just wanted you to hear about it today. Next slide. All right, we have, we have three Austin P. Nursing programs. Can you go to the next slide? The first one, of course, is the one you probably hear about a lot, our BSN. It's our four-year degree, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Next slide. And then we're happy, let's see, of January of last year, we started our own Masters of Science in Nursing called our MSN program. And we have two concentrations. We have a family nurse practitioner route and a nurse educator route. Next slide. We have our post-master certificate, and these are the same concentrations. And what this is, is these are students that already have their master's, and they want to come back, let's say, just like myself, I have a master's in pediatric nurse practitioner. If I wanted to come back to Austin P and get my post-master's, since I already had a master's degree, and choose the FNP family nurse practitioner route, that was something that we offer them. Let me tell you a little bit of story about the girl in the middle holding a computer. This is Jen, and Jen was an active duty um, military student as well as her husband. They both graduated in the same class last year. Um, you talk about two Spitfires, man. They were gung-ho, um, resilient, caring, very, very knowledgeable um, students. And um, she had her third baby during her last semester of nursing school. This girl never missed a test, never missed a lecture. She never missed a clinical. Um, and that just goes to show what kind of students we have in our program that I'm very proud of. Next slide. Some great news. Um, it's good news, but I call it great news. We um, this past in 2018, we had a we did our after our self study, we were awarded from CCNE accreditation until 2023, and so we have to be reaccredited about every five years. This took a lot of um, blood, blood, sweat, and tears, um, but we did it, and we were very proud to say that. We also have three new doctorates in our nursing faculty um, that just earned their doctorate degrees, um, and that's very important. We have continued growth in all three of our programs, and I'll show you in a slide coming up of our growth and how we're doing. Hopefully one day we'll get a new health science building in the future. I know that may be on hold for now, but you know that's up and coming, and as we are growing, we need places for um, to house these students so we can teach them and get them out in the hospital settings and the medical facilities to be great nurses. And then we also have um, a McCampbell donor. She actually awards our new sophomore classes every um, semester at a white coat ceremony with a monetary gift. And um, they don't even know they get this. And I'll show you a picture of the white coat ceremony in just a second. But it's usually, you know, anywhere from $100 to $300. Um, so they can use it for books or any type of funding needs they need for their school. So that's exciting. Next slide. So each fall and each spring, we do white coat ceremonies for our bachelor's of science students and our master's students. And basically, this is just welcoming them to the program, telling them how excited we are, um, awarding them with the black, uh, black, oh, black pass and a white coat, um, and just getting them excited to be the future nurses and to start um, their semesters ahead to complete for graduation. We've been doing this about two years and the students and the family members really love it and we do too. Next slide. So here's just a, a graph of our nursing growth over the past three years from 2017 to 2019. As you can see, the red bars are for our um, Bachelor's of Science, our BSN program, and we are slowly gaining headway. Um, and right now, this semester, we have 294 because these um, statistics were from fall of 19. The black bars are our MSN program. And so 149 to 154, the only reason it slumped down just a little bit is because we also have pulled out of, we are pulling out of something called Tennessee eCampus. We have been doing a master's um, program with them over the past 10 years, and that is slowly ending in December of 2020. So as we started our program a year ago, we are kind of combining those students, losing some and adding more. So that's the only reason we see the slope go down in that area. And then the gray is our R in the BSN um, program. And so you see where it goes from 60 to 61 to 98. We have almost 100 students and our goal is to have about 120 um, by the end of the year. So we're really excited in growth. Next slide. So sustainability, of course, is so important in our program, but there's Sweet Brandy. 
Randy Holt is one of my old advisees too. And I promise I didn't pick all these pictures of my people that I, that, that I had stories about, but I know quite a few of them. But she um, was pretty cool too. She was a first year, um, first, she's the first in her family to graduate college and a first generation college student. Um, and Brandy was another one of those who got in based on her grades and her teeth test scores. And she grew as the semesters went by. And I had to do a lot of life talks with her in my office and as her advisee, as her advisor. But she um, graduated about, I think it's been about two years. She's working as an emergency room nurse here in Tenova, our local hospital, and loving every minute of it. So I'm so proud of her. Next slide. So just a little bit about our pre-licensure program, the BSN program. We have a currently about 294 students. We have a really neat partnership with Premier Medical Group. So what we do is we send students, um, senior nursing students out um, in the semester as part of their clinicals, and they, they have been doing diabetic education through follow-up call, calls with their um, diabetic patients. And that has really worked out well. Um, it, we have seen drops in their hemoglobin A1Cs. The patients love the, the feedback, just talking to an individual, just to know that they care about them. So that is ongoing, and we are very proud of that. We have a new partnership with the Tennessee State Veterans Home, and we also collaborate, like the slide says, with about 44, probably a little more, clinical sites in Tennessee and Kentucky for clinical placements. We have 294 students, so we have to rotate them through all these clinical sites um, each semester for about 80 hours for each student. So it's pretty takes a lot of planning um, and a lot of collaboration with these facilities, and they're always been so awesome to work with. Next slide. So our RN to BSN program, what this is, this is two-year RNs that come in and they do, they apply for an online, or online BSN program. So once they complete the program, they'll have a four-year degree from Austin P. Um, and so, like I said, the numbers are at 100 right now, and they're continually growing. Our goal is, of course, 120 in the coming months. One of the cool things about this program is that during the year, they have five different start dates. So they're seven-week courses, and so five times a year, they could start into our program, and it's not just once a year, twice a year. And this is very, very helpful for all these RNs, because the majority of them are working already in our hospitals, and they work full-time and go to school full-time. So that's why this option and being online is great for these working RNs. Um, they are also investigating some articulation agreements with state community colleges. And with that being said, basically, when they are finishing up their two-year degrees, they are already applying to a school like Austin P and taking some classes before they even graduate and take their board for the two-year degree. So that's exciting. And we're um, working with some of our local colleges and surrounding college, community colleges to keep this intact and, and to get more of their students. And, of course, we're always out marketing and working on recruitment plans to develop um, partnerships and to entice all the RNs that are out there to um, get their four-year degree, which is so important. Next slide. Our master's degree, of course, I said started in 2019, in January. Um, we already talked about the concentrations. Currently, we have about 94 students, and that's just in one year, and we are very proud of those numbers. They just completed their CCNE accreditation um, this past, they started this past fall and winded up in January and we're waiting to hear results in April, but we had very good feedback and I know we'll have very promising results when we hear back from the board. Next slide. Um, actually, go back one slide. Let me tell a little story about Chevy. The sweet African-American girl laughing in the middle, that's Chevy. And, um, I love her to pieces. Her story is she's a mom of four, too. This is her second career. Um, and that girl never not, does not have a smile on her face. It could, she could be getting ready for the hardest test. We're having two tests a day, and her kid's sick, and, you know, her husband's deployed. But you talk about civility and loving what she does and, and being that compassionate, competent, courageous caretaker, it's Debbie. And I'm so proud of her. She's scheduled to graduate in May. And I know she will go out there and make us so proud just because of who she is and of how we've molded her just in the, um, the nursing class settings. But her personality and that smile just exuberates what it, what it is to be an office nurse. All right, next slide. So this slide speaks for itself. We are a very diverse school. 
Um, we have a lot of men, a lot of military affiliated. We have probably, I don't know the exact percentage of non-traditional, but I would say about 30% non-traditional. Um, we have a lot of ethnic and minority students that we are so lucky to teach. Um, right now in our sophomore class, that they, the ones that just started in August, I think we have almost 20 men, and that's a huge number than we've had in a long time. And the more men, the merrier. I mean, we need a lot of men to lift those heavy patients and, and to train to be just as great caregivers as women. So we're excited about our diversity at Austin P. Next slide. So just a few grants that um, some of our faculty are working on. One of the rural FN3 preceptor grant, and basically, this is out of it's going to cover five rural counties and surrounding Montgomery County, and it offers stipends to, the, to support graduate students for paying their preceptors. So they have to basically do anywhere from 100, uh, about 500 precepted hours working as a family nurse practitioner. So hopefully, this grant, if we receive it, is for about five thousand dollars, will help pay these preceptors, because unfortunately it's hard to find preceptors to train our students, so this is very vital. Um, another one called Learn, Design, Apply Telehealth, and we're learning a lot about telehealth right now since we can't meet face-to-face -face in most places in hospital and um, the doctor office setting. But this is a grant that would offer about $50,000. Um, we're hopefully to hear from them in the spring of 2021, and it involves a lot of rural counties, that basically you do face-to-face, -face, just like I'm talking to y'all face-to-face, and do um, health care that way. So that's exciting. We have been doing a primary care grant with Matthew Walker. It's um, a clinic on the north side of town for about 10 years, and Dr. Shondell Hickson and Dr. Patty Orr have been working closely with these diabetic patients and have seen their numbers um, really lower in their um, scores for their hemoglobin A1Cs and just delivering great care. So that has just been a tremendous, tremendous grant that we've been fortunate to be involved in. And it just ended and they just actually submitted um, their numbers and um, their outcomes to um, the appropriate people. So we're excited to see how that went. And then I started something uh, two years ago with Parks Montgomery County Schools since they're such a huge piece of our community, um, and I love children, um, and being the PE effort professor that I am, I did went to more. I mean Norman Smith Elementary School, and we followed the BMIs of third graders. And so we did a bunch of a, a three-week teaching session. I brought in healthy food that Publix had donated. We did exercise plans. We just talked about ditching the soda and drinking more water, just basic basic health things that they could do. And we also had um, books that we got about $2,000 for. And so each third grader in these classes went home with two health books about family health and how to stay healthy at home. And also it taught them to read. So we have been following these students for the past two years. And um, I'm supposed to, with the help of some of my colleagues, re-measure um, their BMIs just to see how they've done. Um, and so we'll see what kind of success we've had and what, um, what positive outcomes we have. There are many more grants out that we're doing, but this is just a few I wanted to share with you. Next slide. So we have quite a few scholarships because, like I said, our population of students are, you know, a lot of times we have a lot of first generation and a lot of Pell Grant recipients, you know, and so we offer a lot of opportunities for scholarships through our SCC um, New Chapter 5. Chapter. We do Clarkson Montgomery County Health Foundation. We've awarded over $250,000 to our students, which is huge and so important because they really depend on this. And even Northcrest Hospital offers scholarships to our R and to BSN students who are coming back to get their four-year degree. Um, so that's very important and we're very proud of. Next slide. So the success rate, like Dr. White has just briefly shared with you, we are so, so proud of this. Um, the red bars is 2017, of course, the gray is 2018, and the black is 2019. And if you look to the left, um, in 2017, we had a 95% pass rate of our board rate, which is our standardized NCLEX exams that students have to pass in order to go out and practice in the medical facilities. In 18, we had 97%, and last year we had 100%. So we are so very proud of that. And if you look to the, to the bars to the right, the 80 percentages over the past three years, that's basically compared to the national average. So we are well above bar, um, and I can't 
say enough about our faculty that help get our students there and also our students that are so driven and committed to learning. Um, over the past three years, we, our average completion rate of the program has been greater than 85% because we will lose students through the two-year period due to, you know, life emergencies. And then our three-year average employment rate is greater than 94%. So we are so, so proud of the student success rate. And, you know, in, in semesters to come, we, we hope to see it in the high 90s again. So without my faculty and without these students that are all driven and collaborate together, we couldn't do it. So next slide. And so I want to end this presentation with this picture. Um, it really kind of is near and dear to my heart, but we had a student, and his name's out me get all mushy on you, but sometimes nurses get mushy. But um, Chet Brown's his name. And Chet um, came back to nursing school. Let's see, he graduated a year ago. Chet was already had been a um, in a first career. He was in his late 20s, early 30s. But he actually came and spoke at our white coat ceremony this past um, fall to the students because I wanted them to hear from somebody who just graduated and for these new sophomores to know that through trials and tribulations like he has experienced, you can do this. And Chet um, shared with the students that his father, um, before he began nursing school, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And as he was sitting by his bedside and watching these nurses take care of him day in and day out, he realized he was in the wrong profession. He wanted to go back to school and help and just make differences just like these, these nurses did for his father. Um, but he found this picture uh, that Austin P, one of the photographers took of him holding this diploma and he said, Dr. Rice, I knew that was me. He said, I was going through those pictures and I saw that purple band that I wear for my dad and it says hope, courage, and faith. And he says, I knew I did it. I completed Austin Peay's nursing program. I did it for my dad, who's not here anymore. And I did it because of all you faculty that cared so much about our students and myself, and I thank you. And those are the reasons why I love our School of Nursing. Those are the reasons why I teach these students, and those are the reasons why my heart is so into this program, and so are our other faculty members, because of him and all these stories that they share with us on a daily basis from semester to semester. It's for students like them, that go out and because of their caring and their compassion and their stories that they've had with their own personal life and dilemmas make a difference. So thank you, I hope, um, well, I'm gonna share one more thing and I'm gonna be done. Just a little story about my husband. My husband had open heart surgery about when he was 28, about 20 years ago. And four years ago, we had to go back to, all, to Vanderbilt because Jason needed another procedure. And we were in Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And me being an office grad, you know, I was really, you know, and a nurse myself, I was really nervous, but I knew he was in great hands. But as, as we rotated through checking in at Vanderbilt, through um, pre-op, uh, there was a nurse that actually, she was our pre-op nurse, and I, she was online as my master's student in my pediatric course at the time. Um, we went to, after he was done with his procedure, we went to um, the floor, and there were three Austin P nurses on that floor that were taking care of my husband, and I knew that we were in such great hands. Um, so, and as Jason was discharged, and as time went on, all those you know, Austin P nursing students and nurses in general played such a huge part, and I knew that he was going to be just fine, and he was in the best care, and I could go home and get a good night's sleep, because I knew they were going to be taking care of him. So, Besides just my story, these stories are so important. I just wanted you to hear today um, how, how great this program is doing in all three areas and the potential we have to just take in more students and go further and, and produce these wonderful uh, nurses that are going to take care of your families um, in the days ahead. So thank you for, this, for allowing me to come on today and share um, our story, and I'm very, very proud of our school of nursing. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you. Well, Dr. Rice and, and Dr. Shank, uh, uh, thank you so much for all you do. Um, what a compelling story, and uh, you make us all proud to be governors, I can tell you that. And I, I had, had the opportunity to serve on the Community Health Foundation board for a number of years, and, and one, uh, one of the meetings, we went over to the nursing school and got uh, kind of a tour and saw the mannequins and uh, 
got much more of an understanding of, of what it is that you do. And I, I might suggest that, that the board get an opportunity to do that at some point. Um, it was fascinating and, and very impressive. It's only uh, what it'll be like when we get a new health building. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And we'd love to give you a tour anytime. Uh, thank you. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Mueller, Chair of the Academic Affairs Committee, to give us a report on the committee meeting from yesterday. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from yesterday's Academic Affairs Committee meeting. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items, which will be presented to you for action in today's meeting. Consideration of tenure appointments, consideration of Master of Speech Language Pathology Program. The committee reviewed and granted Dr. Bassan's petition for the right to appeal the recommendation decision to the Board of Trustees. That concludes my report. I move that the Board approve the minutes of the March 19th Academic Affairs Committee as written. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Academic Affairs Committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes of the Academic Affairs Committee signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Trustee Mueller's Trustee report O'Malley. contained that. Yes. Let me stop you there. I'm sorry. I need you to call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Here. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? <clears throat> Trustee Jenkins? Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Mueller's report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Mueller, do you have a motion for us? Yes, you have before you a copy of the list of faculty recommended for tenure. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the list of faculty recommended for tenure. And because it's a motion of the committee, we do not need a second. You've heard the motion on the faculty tenure item. Uh, is there any discussion? Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Trustee Jenkins? Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? I see Don's uh, telephone thing is uh, muted, so you might want to sideways call him. We'll work on that. How's that? Trust Can you there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. The motion is carried. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Consideration of Master of Speech Language Pathology. You have before you a copy of the proposed Master of Speech Language Pathology program. By direction of the committee, I move to approve the proposed Master of Speech Language Pathology program. Thank you. You've heard the motion on the Master of Speech Language Pathology. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the Master of Speech Language Pathology. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Trustee Carroll? Yes. 
Trustee yes. Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Guadia? Yes. yes. Thank you, the motion carries. I'd now like to recognize Trustee Jenkins, Chair of the Student Affairs Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you for the opportunity to present my report from yesterday's Student Affairs Committee meeting. The committee reviewed and approved the following action item, selection of a student trustee. This item will be presented to you for action in today's meeting. The committee reviewed the following information item, residence life curriculum. That concludes my report. I move that the board approve the minutes of the March 19th Student Affairs Committee as written. Thank you, Don. Is there a second? Second. second. Catherine Tanata. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Student Affairs Committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of adopting the minutes in the Student Affairs Committee signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Uh, I need any to call opposed? The, I need to call the roll, Trustee O'Malley. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee <clears throat> Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Trustee Jenkins' report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Jenkins, do you have a motion for us? Yes. Uh, you have before you the information regarding the three individuals who applied and were selected as finalists to serve as our next student trustee. After careful discussion and deliberation, the committee proposes that the board select Abby Hogan to serve in this position. By direction of the committee, I move that we select Abby Hogan to serve as our next student trustee. The student will serve a one-year term beginning on May 8, 2020, the day after commencement and running through the 2021 academic year. Thank you. You've heard the motion on the selection of the student trustee. Is there any discussion? By the way, I would just add that all three candidates as usual were outstanding and it was a difficult decision. Hearing no uh, discussion, the question on the selection of the student trustee, secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. The motion carries. Uh, I'd now like to recognize Trustee Kanata, Chair of the Audit Committee, to give us a report of the committee meeting yesterday. Thank you. Yesterday, the Audit Committee meeting met and reviewed and approved two items. We approved the revised internal audit plan for fiscal year 2020. We approved the revision to the University Policy 1016, preventing and reporting fraud, waste, and or abuse. We then listened to presentations regarding the following items. We listened to presentations on the review of the internal audit related charters and policies. We listened to the internal audit reports released between October 30th, 2019 and February 17th, 2020, with a list of outstanding audit recommendations. We also listened to a presentation on the financial and compliance audit report of fiscal year 2019 and the overview of the upcoming sunset audit performed by the Comptroller's Office. That concludes my report. 
I move that we approve the minutes of the audit committee meeting on March 19th, 2020 as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the audit committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. Uh, uh, I recognize now Trustee Atkins, Chair of the Business and Finance Committee, to give us a report of their committee meeting yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yesterday, the committee received the following actions. Consideration of non-mandatory fees for the Just a second. And consideration of the housing rates for 2020, 2021 academic year. And these items will be presented for your review and action in a few minutes. The committee also reviewed the following information items review of the governor's budget recommendation and review of the fiscal year 2018 2019 financial report. Recently, the governor held a state of the state address where his budget was discussed for the next fiscal year. The budget will be approved in the legislature in the spring. The governor's budget was shared with the committee. Additionally, information from the financial report for the fiscal year 2018 and 2019 was shared with the committee. The composite financial index was shared. The university's current composite financial index is 1.89, which is uh, mid-level of the nine or ten uh, public universities in the state. That concludes my report. I move that the board approve the minutes of the March 19th Business and Finance Board Committee as written. Thank you, Trustee Atkins. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the Business and Finance Committee meeting. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. The minutes are approved. Trustee Atkins' report contained action items that we need to consider as a full board. Trustee Atkins, do you have a motion for us? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. You have before you a copy of the non-mandatory fees for the 2020-2021 academic year. And by direction of the committee, I move to approve the non-mandatory fees for the 2020-2021 academic year. You have heard the motion on the, the consideration of non-mandatory fees for the 2020-2021 academic year. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the consideration of non-mandatory fees for 2020 and 2021. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Trustee Atkins, do you have an additional motion? Yes, I do. It's a consideration of the housing rates for the 2020-2021 academic year. You have before you a copy of the housing rates for the 2020-2021 academic year. In the direction of the committee, I move to approve the housing rates for the 2020-2021 academic year, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You've heard the motion on the consideration of the housing rates for the 2020-2021 academic year. 
Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the consideration of the housing rates for 2020, 2021. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Agin? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Miller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present my report now from yesterday's executive committee meeting. The committee reviewed and approved the following action items. Uh, we cons the consideration of Austin P. State University's mission profile. This item will be presented for your review and action after the approval of the executive committee meet minutes. That concludes my report. I move now that the board approve the minutes of the March 19th executive committee as written. Is there a second? I second that. Yeah, Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the minutes of the executive committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. You should have before you Austin Peay's mission profile. By direction of the committee, I move that the board approve Austin Peay State University's mission profile. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of Austin Peay's mission profile. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Trustee Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. We are being asked to approve a naming request for the Stone, Rudolph, and Henry Govs Gallery. I'd like to introduce Lieutenant General Ron Bailey, Vice President for External Affairs, to provide information on the request. Chairman O'Malley, uh, this action item is a request presented to the Board of Trustees uh, to approve the naming of the Stone Rudolph and Henry Gov Gallery, located on the second floor of the lobby of the Kimbrough Building. Stone Rudolph and Henry Public Limited Company donated transformative gifts through the College of Business to assist with student success. The gifts meet the requirements to name a classroom side of state. The recommendation to name the Stone Rudolph and Henry Gov Gallery was made by a campus committee appointed in compliance with the Austin Peay State University Policy 7-009 naming rooms and areas and buildings plaques. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. You've heard the expl explanation from General Bailey. Is there a motion to approve the naming of the Stone, Rudolph, and Henry Gov's Gallery? Motion. Oh. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you. It's moved and seconded that we approve the naming of the gallery. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, the question on the approval of the naming of the Stone, Rudolph, and Henry Govs Galleries. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Atkins? Yes. Trustee Kanata? Yes. Trustee Carroll? Yes. Jenkins? Yes. Trustee Luck? Yes. Trustee May? Yes. Trustee Mueller? Yes. Trustee O'Malley? Yes. Trustee Wadia? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. I'd now like to invite uh, Mitch Robinson, Vice President for Finance and Administration, to provide an update on the search for the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Chairman Malley. Uh, it's my pleasure to give you a report, an update, actually, on the search for our next uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost. 
Uh, I must share with you the uh, outstanding search committee that was put together uh, by President White. Uh, we have with us on the search committee Dr. Soma Banerjee. Uh, he is an assistant professor for history and philosophy. We have Dr. Beatrix Brockman, associate professor, language and literature. Ms. Amy Corlew, our director of admissions. Dr. Kalina Dunkel, uh, Associate Professor of Geosciences. Ms. Nancy Gibson, Associate Professor of the Library. Ms. Sydney Hawkins, our SGA President. Dean Barry Jones, of College of Arts and Sciences, or Arts and Letters, excuse me. Uh, we have Dr. Tim Leszczek, Professor of Health and Human Performance. Uh, Dr. Andrew Luna, who is our Executive Director of Decision Support and Institutional Research. Dr. Gloria Millen, Associate Professor of Management, Monkey Marketing, and General Business. And Mr. Joe Mills, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, Housing, Residence Life, and Dining Services. Dr. Rod Mills, Associate Professor of Agriculture, and our Faculty Senate President. And Dr. Eve Rice, you heard of from earlier, Professor and Director of the School of Nursing and Dr. Anthony Sanders, Associate Professor of the College of Education. What a, 15 members in all. It's a, a, a very a great uh, committee to work with. And uh, we got started on January 22nd and 23rd with a visit to the campus by a search committee that is Stone Beck Search, is uh, our committee, our search co consultant. Uh, that met with a full cross-section of the campus leadership, the city provost, uh, Dr. Gandhi, direct reports to uh, Dr. Gandhi, faculty and faculty leadership, department chairs, and uh, staff partners and students. Uh, they started an aggressive prospect and nominator outreach that began on February the 14th, and the advertising became active on February the 18th. So far, we've had uh, good meetings and progress uh, updates with the search committee, uh, first of all, on March 3rd, during which they gave us some very valuable feedback regarding how the pool was developing. And uh, we also had representatives from our human resource and diversity, equity, and inclusion offices to help provide some training to the search committee uh, about being mindful about biases and that type of thing. Uh, we did meet on Wednesday, March 18th, at which time we uh, were working to narrow the pool down for consideration of interviews and referencing. Uh, once we get approval of that, that group, we will actually begin our interviews on March the 30th and 31st. Uh, of course, it's really challenging because we're doing all of this now virtually. And as you can understand, uh, because of the way we're handling this uh, meeting today, it does have some interesting challenges. Uh, give, let me give you some statistics about the pool. There were uh, about 900 or so people that were contacted about the opportunity. Sources and nominations were 291 individuals. There are uh, 35 total nominees. There were 15 that uh, applied. Uh, and there were 15 that still have yet to apply, uh, but uh, some were not interested. So the total applicants for this position uh, were 90, and I think that's outstanding uh, because of the interest in Austin P and what it is that we're doing here and is such a positive impact on how many applicants we were able to get. Uh, we have reviewed uh, about 58 of those applicants, and the uh, composite uh, were 68 males, 22 females. We also have uh, a very good diversity, about 34%. Uh, we had 15 sitting past or interim provost apply. And we also had 22 states represented in the pool. Uh, I'm not going to list them all, but we also had four countries outside the United States. So uh, again, uh, the, the process is going very well got a strong committee, we got a strong pool. And so our intent is to uh, hopefully be able to have a new provost sitting, uh, I don't know, maybe virtually by July 1, <laughs> 2020. 
So uh, that's my report, Chairman O'Malley. Any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you, uh, Mitch, for a great report. Uh, that's very encouraging and, and uh, exciting going forward. So it sounds like a lot of work to do for the committee. Uh, I'd now like to invite Dr. Eric Norman, Vice President for Student Affairs, to provide an update on the Division of Student Affairs. Good morning. Uh, for the Division of Student Affairs, at this point we are we, we are moving things online. Uh, we have quickly been able to transition a lot of our programming to meet the students' needs, whether they're here or away from campus. Uh, each office has a steady stream of programs while also providing the ability for our students to set appointments for either telephonic, Zoom, or in-person meetings. Of course, we're, we're dissuading the latter. Uh, we are still certainly open for business. Uh, been predominantly actually working with students that are having to travel back to their home country. That's, that's been something that's been a little more of a conversation of late, uh, making sure students are able to, to get to where they need to and understanding what would happen if they are not here on campus. But overall, I've been very pleased with the resiliency of our students. Uh, in particular, some of our students are at risk. Uh, you know, for example, students that have typically used our mental health related services. Uh, they were asked if they could pare down a little bit rather than coming down onto campus uh, to use telehealth, uh, and they've been very receptive to that. Uh, in fact, we, we've gone to uh, about a tenth of our usual face-to-face -face contact for counseling, which is very impressive considering this time and how this is creating stress on our students. Uh, we are trying to encourage students to move out of the residence hall, but we will remain open. We know we have students that uh, if they were not given the option to stay on campus, they do not have a place to go. Uh, and we are still keeping our dining services open and Elvin period down. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Norman. And thank you and, and so many on your team and throughout the university that are uh, working hard to keep things moving in these uh, uncertain times. So uh, thank you for that report. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to now invite Mr. Michael Cassitz, Assistant Vice President for Public Safety, to provide an update on the university's coronavirus preparedness. <coughs> Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to inform you of what we are doing to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 on our campus. Since the creation of the COVID-19 task force, there have been 27 members who have worked incredibly hard to prepare for and implement necessary changes. With the CDC recommending social distancing, we had to address continuance of instruction, what to do with housing, dining, employees, student workers, new legislation, study abroad students, and many other issues too numerous to discuss. The move to online instruction is not an easy task. Many faculty have not taught online and do not use our learning management software. When the decision was made to change our method of instruction, we had an army of people who were ready to assist the faculty to ensure continue to receive quality education. Training programs were created quickly to assist with this transition. Some academic programs require clinicals, internships, practical work experience, and real tech such as student teaching. Program coordinators had to adjust to ensure students are able to meet the requirements of their certifications or licensures and to stay on track to graduation. We had to provide guidance to those who are part of federal programs, such as federal work study, VA work study, and GI Bill recipients. Changing our method of instruction had implications that could not be remedied at the university level. We had to seek remedies from the federal government to serve these students. Dr. Norman has already told you what we've done on that housing and dining side. Um, the university had to ensure that not only are our students cared for, but faculty and staff as well. Faculty and staff face, face issues such as being in a higher risk category and or having no child care when K-12 schools closed. We created a modified telecommuting procedure to make it easier for our employees to work from home. This allows us to also help alleviate some personal stressors. We can keep offices open on campus. Many 
are using a revolving schedule, so certain employees are only working on campus one or two days a week. We have many students who are part-time or temporary employees of the university who cannot afford to, lo to lose income. We have multiple solutions to ensure those students are still receiving their regular pay. We have both long-term and short-term study abroad students who are in Europe. After the European travel ban was announced by the White House, all students were able to get home thanks to the tireless work from the study abroad staff who spent many hours on the phone securing flights and hotels. We have been communicating almost incessantly with the university community. Some may be upset by the number of emails the COVID-19 task force have spent. <laughs> However, it is our duty to ensure we provide appropriate information in a timely manner. One of the biggest challenges we have faced is that a short time after we send information, the situation changes and we have to update our communications. We continue to monitor new federal and state legislation to ensure compliance and help our students, faculty, and staff. We have daily meetings to discuss emerging issues. These are done through video chats because we're not allowed to have more than 10 people in a room. We have adjusted well to the new technologies. We have a talented group of people on the task force. I can email and text messages continuously, even at 4 o'clock in the morning, providing updates, information, or concerns. The task force is dealing with the immediate issues and short-term future. While the task force is dealing with this semester, planning is already taking place for May semester, summer, and beyond. I want to thank the senior leadership team for their guidance and leadership to and empowerment of the task force. Thanks to the task force members who spent countless hours working towards getting us through this crisis. And thanks to all the students, faculty, and staff who remain flexible as virus mitigation evolves. In closing, I want to assure each of you that we are learning from this process and updating our continuity plan. We are keeping detailed information about our response and mitigation efforts. We will do a major debrief after this is over to see what worked and how we can improve for the future. We will learn many lessons and be able to apply them to the next continuity event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassitz, uh, for all that you're doing and all that your team is doing in these uh, tough times. So uh, we appreciate it very much and thank you for the great report. Thank you, Mr. Romano. At this time, I'd like to recognize President White to give her report and also to report on any interim items. Thank you, Chairman O'Malley, and thank you to the trustees. Uh, I just, I'm going to be a little bit more random right now just to communicate some things to you that I think are really important, and I really am proud of the team today. Thank you to uh, AVP Cassitz and, and VP Norman and all our whole group for um, the great presentations. Um, but I would remit, I would be remiss if I didn't start off by saying uh, thank you to Provost Scandy. Uh, this is his last board meeting as provost. He'll continue in that role through the end of May. And then he's going to work with me on some really important predictive analytics um, projects. I'll tell you that, that he and his team, Dr. Luna and um, a former graduate student, Daniel graduated, didn't he, are, have worked together on predicting enrollment patterns and submitted a paper, a white paper, to um, a national conference and won best paper of that conference because their work really is extraordinary. And I really don't want to lose that intellectual capital, that brain power, so I asked him to continue to work with me on some of those things. We did not realize that every data point that we had is going to be um, almost irrelevant because of all the intervening variables of um, working in an environment of the coronavirus. That said, a lot of the work in new programs and enrollment uh, growth and working to um, just build our offerings and put in some infrastructure has, has been because of the diligence and hard work and the experience that Dr. Gandhi brought to Austin P. And so I'm very grateful. And I, I shouldn't tell him today, but I will tell him that, uh, but I'm going to tell him today, we've been working on a reception, but you may have to come back for it because I don't know when we can hold it, but we would like to say thank you <laughs> in a very formal way. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Gandy. So you, you were supposed to be yesterday at our farm, at the Austin P. Farm, and I'm really proud of that. We're going to bring you back sometime to visit the farm. But I also wanted to, to just give a shout out to our faculty who were prepared to show you the farm. We had students blow drying cows for you and, and you know they gave the little uh, clips um, 
for the hair and, and, and we're really ready to show off their work. We have a, a couple of new calves. We've got a new strain of, of calf that was ready to, for a de debut. And so I just want to say thank you to all the folks who worked really hard to prepare for your visit. That didn't happen, but we will, um, of course, reschedule that in the future. You heard a great report from the School of Nursing and I appreciate Dr. Rice showing you the pictures of the students. And the reason that was so important is because when you are in a healthcare crisis or you're just concerned about something, it's really important that you go to someone that you think cares about you, who's really paying attention to you, who's really noticing the signs that you're exhibiting in, in healthcare. And so this whole initiative of, of kindness matters really does matter because part of the healthcare fight is making people feel comfortable. Dr. Rice talked about three uh, faculty members earning the doctorate. I have to tell you that's incredible because finding doctorally prepared nursing faculty is very difficult nationally. And so Austin P is trying a, a grow your own. Uh, we talked about grow your own in, in teacher prep. It's also really important in um, nursing education. And that's very important to our uh, following SAC COC guidelines for accreditation. You have to have so many doctorally prepared faculty if you're teaching graduate programs and upper level classes. And so that is a huge, huge win um, on the part of the School of, of Nursing and their faculty. Also, the photos of the Simulation Center, you saw a lot of those today. It's not quite the same thing as, as dealing with, with a, a live patient, but I wanted you to know that they have scenarios built in to those simulation uh, mannequins. And some of those mannequins be, can be, I, I haven't looked at how much we're paying right now. I'll go back to my days as a provost when um, I had nursing. And then it was, it was very common to spend $45,000, $50,000 and up to $90,000 per simulation mannequin. And so it's a very expensive endeavor and we do have a wonderful sim center and we're looking forward to being able to move that in a new building when we can. So obviously um, the work of the university is continuing. It's looking different than it was supposed to look, but we are not shutting down. We have students who depend on us to help them earn a degree and stay on track to graduation. And that's incredibly important. But I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on that are continuing even in uh, today's environment. We added a new concentration in intelligent robotics to the BS in computer science last year because of the high interest in robotics in K-12 schools. And just a few weeks ago, Northeast High School brought their Computer Information Technology Academy for students to learn more about how robotics are integrated into various fields. And students are learning how to move robotics into unfamiliar spaces, just as we remove, or excuse me, maneuver through new, new places every day. And I think about that, you know, we don't have a Zumba at home or a Roomba. I don't know, some of you may have those. But how do you program robots to actually maneuver through spaces that they haven't seen before? And we started working on these remarks um, a few weeks ago before we were ever in the coronavirus. But I was thinking how nice it would be if our restaurants could actually use a robot to handle, hand the takeout to the, to the car. I mean, it could be that what we're doing now is going to help us in uh, future pandemics. And so I appreciate, with, I appreciate the faculty and staff for being responsive in this area. We've talked a little bit about the enrollment growth. Um, I always want to bring you some idea of where we are in enrollment of the locally governed institutions, those are the six outside of the UT system. We're one of only two who have seen positive growth in the last four years. The average increase in enrollment for the last two years, um, including the UT system for, for the state institutions, has been a half a percent. Ours was 2.2 percent. Our growth last fall was just incremental. We did set another record. But it wasn't a huge, uh, a huge increase. But I wanted to remind you that in an environment when many of our sister institutions are losing enrollment, um, what's been done here by people who are not me has been absolutely heroic. And our sister institutions who are facing these issues are having to make significant budget adjustments because of that. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you to our enrollment management team 
thank you to all of the hard work uh, going on in admissions and financial aid and the registrar's office and in the, the huge groups of faculty and staff who come to participate with prospective students and their families who are looking for that, that next um, place in the student's life in terms of which college to, to join. And so if it were not for their extraordinary work, we would not be in the situation we were in. We wouldn't be talking about incremental growth. We would be talking about the hundreds of students that we would have lost. We told you at the last meeting that we hired new advisors and we partnered with College Possible to bring some coaches online. And I'm really happy to say that retention rates have increased significantly for our underserved student population. So those, those advisors and coaches are working with the most at-risk students. And while our overall retention rate only bumped about a half a percent, the retention rates in those underserved populations were um, significantly improved, as much as 8% for some of them. They were 3%, 5%, 8%. And so we'll bring you, next year we'll bring you uh, some real numbers, um, but I really believe that those interactions and interventions with the advisors and the coaches made a difference in our students being able to continue or not. We also saw improvement in students who came with academic deficiencies in writing or mathematics or reading. Um, their retention, retention rates improved and we had a higher passing percentage rate for those students in those courses than we have had in the past. So now what we need to do is try to figure out the magic sauce, that touch that's going on with those students and expand that to more students, which is going to take some investment on our part. Well, thankfully, um, a couple of years ago, we contracted with Tutor.com to offer online tutoring to students, and now we need it more than ever because we are asking our students as much as possible to stay home. Now, I realize that some cases they have to work, but we need them not coming to campus as much as possible or we're not going to get a real uh, traction on stopping the spread of the coronavirus. And so academic um, support center is not always open and we're also asking people to work online. So academic affairs and, this, and through the work of the task force and then the, the experts in these areas are working hard to move these services online, which is also costing quite a bit of money. So we're having to um, change our contracts with some vendors. We're, we're trying to put people on the ground. I, have to, I want to put a great big shout out to Student Affairs. We have a group of, of Student Affairs professionals who typically work with students in programming, in student life and leadership, and they work on other student success initiatives. And I was in a meeting recently and um, Dr. Nolan, uh, excuse me, Dr. Norman said, we can repurpose some of our work to support academic affairs and reach out to these students by offering support, student success support. And I just think it's just one more example of our team saying, we're gonna provide services that may look different, that may be delivered in a different way, but we're gonna to continue to do everything that we can to help these students graduate. And, and so I'm very pleased about that. The Erickson College of Education was highlighted in the spotlight in the last board meeting and talked to you about the Grow Your Own program and that early uh, learning teacher residency program that we have with the uh, Clarkson Montgomery County School System. Just wanted to report that a few days ago, uh, before we were all told to stay home, I was in a meeting with Governor Lee and the Commissioner of Education here in Tennessee, as well as the Commissioner, excuse me, Executive Director of the uh, Tennessee Higher Education Commissioner, with a group of faculty, not faculty, but uh, presidents and chancellors in public institutions and private institutions. And the, the concept was really, um, concentrated around a literacy program that the state is trying to put in, in place for new teachers and existing teachers who are um, preparing students to join the school systems in the spring, or excuse me, in the fall. And so there were some legislators there as well. Well, this Grow Your Own program that Austin P and Clarkson Montgomery County School System developed came up and the commissioner asked me to give an update to that group because Austin P is leading the state in uh, teacher prep in many areas, and so I'm really proud of their work. The Erickson College of Education also received an A in the 2020 Teacher Prep Review 
from the National Council on Teacher Quality for our undergraduate and graduate programs. Only eight public and private colleges and universities in Tennessee made an A, but we were one of those, and I, I was thrilled by that. In addition, the Tennessee Department of Education awarded the College of Education a $600,000 grant. We, that was just announced to develop an innovative job embedded program for aspiring assistant principals. That is really unusual. There were three $300,000 grants, one for the Middle Tennessee area, one for East Tennessee, and one for West Tennessee. Well, Austin P got two of those three grants to serve East Tennessee and West Tennessee. Again, just another example of govs who are leading. So we've seen a lot of media exposure uh, interest because of what's happening or what did happen in athletics. Um, the Leaf Chronicle published an article today with some quotes from me and, and Gerald Harrison, our athletics director, about what's happening in athletics. And unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, uh, all of our season, spring season is gone. Um, we're following the lead of the NCAA. And it's easy to say, well, that's not a big deal. We'll all huddle at home and, and then resume life. And it is a, a big deal when you're talking about life and death, and I get that. But, but the unfortunate heartbreak for these students is real. We've got students who have worked and really positioned themselves for academic success and success on the playing field. And some of them just lost their athletics programs right as they were starting their seasons. And I just, uh, I just want to say publicly that I, I, my heart goes out to those students who um, had a lot of plans for their spring and winter sports and, and they're being wonderful about it. Their, their attitudes are good. Um, but I think we ought to recognize that they have suffered some loss and the same with our students who are not going to be able to walk across the stage May 8th and 9th. We are going to do everything that we can to give them an opportunity to celebrate because we want to celebrate with them. But it is a loss and some uncertainty. But I'm going to take just a minute and brag on our football team because uh, and we can all brag about their success. And frankly, we had wonderful success with, with basketball. We had wonderful success with volleyball. We, we are having good success with golf and the women's tennis again was killing it and, and men's tennis were moving on and, and you know we, we were having great hopes for the for the seasons to come as well. But just in terms of the value of making it to NCAA play for football particularly, from the la for the last six months of 2019, just for football, we had we had an advertising value equivalency of more than 63 million dollars in exposure nationally. That's a 38 percent increase since last year. Now, what's that going to mean to us? It doesn't really mean that we're going to get all the students around the country to who've heard about Austin P to come here. It does mean that it's an easier sell when we are spending advertising dollars outside of the state to get people to come in. It also changes our brand. And so, and, I, and maybe it doesn't change our brand, but it, but it extends our brand. So as we are advertising for a new provost, we also recently hired a new CIO. Judy Molnar uh, resigned and, and to do some consulting and moved back to, to Ohio after doing a fabulous job. But we hired a new CIO who was an existing CIO with experience at another Texas institution. We have nearly 100 applicants so far for the search that we're doing now. Uh, we're, we're concluding some dean searches and some faculty searches. It helps when people know where Austin P is and they know we're not in Texas. It helps when people know our name and they know that uh, we have a brand and we value our community and our reputation. So another group that's extending our brand is the ROTC program, and I talk to you them. I talk to you about them a lot, but I have to because guess what? They just won another MacArthur Award. So last time I came back and said, "Oh, you know, our ROTC program has won more than anybody else. They've won seven times." So let me revise that. Oh, our ROTC program has won the MacArthur Award more than anybody else in the country. They've won eight times, which is just amazing. Uh, I, I couldn't be more proud. And when we talk about that, we're talking about more than 275 programs 
in the country. They also qualified to uh, represent us at the Sandhurst competition at West Point, and this year I told her I was going to go watch them and have some example and have some interaction with leaders at West Point. And last week that uh, competition was canceled, and I understand that rightly so, but they still represent us well. We've seen increases in our fundraising efforts, and, and when uh, we wrote these remarks a few days ago, and I say we wrote these remarks, I'll have to, I have to give McCartney a shout out. McCartney Johnson, I'll, I will, I'll put a list of things I want to talk about, and she spends her life getting data for me. And so, and McCartney, um, Dr. Johnson and, and Vice President um, Danielle Whiteside have done an incredible work with our wonderful IT folks who, uh, Bill, you guys have done a fabulous job just helping us get through this meeting. But I'm going to just give McCartney some kudos for getting all this data for me. But our team had raised more than $10 million, which is quite a bit more than this time last year. Well, we lost about $6,000 in the last two days because of some other cancellations because of the candlelight ball. So that's an ever-evolving number, but I feel pretty good that we will end the, uh, the year up again because people are responding to the need. We had nearly 700 people signed up to come to the, our biggest fundraiser of the, via, of the year, which was the candlelight ball. And of course, just a few days before that event, we canceled it. And so thank you to all of you who understood, and I thank you for um, many of you who are on the call today, our trustees and our listeners, um, have said, we still want you to keep what we invested, keep our ticket, we're not asking for a refund. We, our, our title sponsors did the same thing. They said, we know you've got expenses that you already paid for, use that and we're in for next year. I mean, that's an incredible response. I also want to say thank you to the Omni Hotel because they, agreed to uh, refund hotel uh, reservation prices to our guests who were going to stay. So we had wonderful community partners at the same time. We were gearing up for the online Govs Gives program, and we've shifted our focus. Um, it's not a time for business as usual. And so the Govs Give uh, program was launched a little bit early. It's not a 24-hour or 48-hour thing. But we're asking people to support an emergency fund, to support students and faculty and staff who are dealing with issues because of the COVID-19 situation. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in just a minute or two. Wanted to give you a brief update where we are on the Impact Center proposal with Montgomery County. When you met last time, you gave us an ability to approve a contract um, or a lease agreement. We are almost there. Uh, the challenge for us getting everything finalized has been, although we agree in principle, there are things that have to meet state requirements and meet county requirements. And so some of that language is still being looked at, but we're almost, we're almost there. It's at the state hands um, and we're getting advice uh, from the state on what they need going forward. Of course, we've been getting advised by them the whole time, but things, uh, as we get to each new level of approval, there are different things that have to be uh, provided to them. What will happen soon is that the lease will be considered by the State Building Commission and the State Bonding Authority. I'm still expecting a good outcome there, and so we'll talk about that partnership as we continue to move forward. So I want to talk about COVID-19. Uh, and just, first of all, my heart goes out to all of you because I know even those who are on the call and our trustees, you're dealing with this in your businesses. Uh, everybody's going to take a financial hit. I understand that. I know that I'm blessed and I'm in a different situation than most. I don't have children at home or children in school that I'm dealing with. I can tell you that my daughter uh, is pulling her hair out as she's working and has her children at home. I have um, the ability to walk to campus. I don't even have to, to move my parking spot. I have a nurturing husband who cooks. Um, he's got a job and he works, but he cooks. We've got families working here and going to school here who are dealing with loss of jobs, loss of income, slowing income, children who are home from school and have to be parented and taught. In some cases, single family households with no support. Uh, we've got people who are having a hard time finding just the necessities in grocery stores. And so my situation is really different 
and I'm thankful for the situation I'm in, but I try to lead from a position of who are our stakeholders? Who are they? What are they facing? What is their situation? And that's why we have such a large coronavirus COVID-19 task force, hoping that people can bring in the perspectives of those we serve. Our students, we want every single one of them to get through and graduate. We have to do that by being very humane and suspending some things that we require. Now, I'm not talking about academic rigor, but I'm talking about having some grace on the way instruction is delivered. We have to have some grace and, and humanity for our faculty who not only are in the situation of having to deal with their own families, but are having to take care of every other person's family and to be very creative on how they meet the needs of our community. I'm so thrilled with the work from our student ab study abroad program. When I heard that the borders were going to close, I called Michael Cassett on a Wednesday night and he called Dr. Chandler right away. She started working that night with her team to try to get kids home. The last one came home yesterday. And every day we've heard a different story. Well, this country will be open or if you're a citizen you can get out here. But our team knew that things would be evolving and made the decision, no, get them back. And now they're back. And so we don't have to worry about some things that we would have to otherwise. Um, we've been monitoring and listening to the guidance of the CDC. And that's one reason that we are, we changed this meeting to be one uh, where you're all remote. And, and even the people in the room with me today, we're, we are spread out. Um, I'm just about ready to make Elliot stay upstairs while I'm downstairs. I'm, we're keeping people really really distant. The meetings that we're having on campus, most of those are virtual because we're not going to put people at risk unless we have to. Now, we have given our folks the ability to uh, telecommute if they can. It doesn't mean that everyone can. There are certain functions that don't lend themselves to telecommuting. We need a police force here. If we've got people in the dorms, we've got to have people to serve them. We've got to have people to serve meals. There are some offices where we haven't figured out how to be able to keep the work going, and those people are still here, and we're trying to increase social distancing. But I have asked our vice presidents and our directors, if they don't have a way to figure it, if, if we haven't figured that out, figure it out. Because my concern is if we have a long period of time that we have to be able to continue the work even if the recommendation changes. We might not have a recommendation. We might actually have a situation where we are instructed, everyone stay home. Well, how can we continue to enroll and register, process financial aid, answer questions? So I've asked our team to work with the offices that are not easily handled remotely to do so in a way that we can address future needs. You heard from um, Michael Cassett's talking about the heroic effort to get faculty support. That's coming from distance education. Who, I mean, that team, they are working day and night. But I'll also say that we also have other faculty who've stepped in to be leaders to teach their um, compatriots on how to do this. And, and the, it may not be moving something online. It may be moving something to the telephone. We just said, don't meet face to face. Find alternative methods for instruction. The budget I'm concerned about, um, but I'll tell you that we're, we're in good shape. Austin P is fiscally responsible. We know how to um, stretch a dollar, and, and we have been stretching those dollars. Great work from Vice President uh, Mitch Robinson and his team on that. I have asked our campus community to be as frugal as possible with things that are non-essential. Because frankly, a lot of what we're doing costs more money. We are having to reallocate funds to be able to uh, hire uh, contract work for this tutoring and advising and then to shift our people over. In some cases, as people are, are telecommuting, we're having to buy more computers just so that they can access a VPN network to get uh, access to Banner which is our um, registration system, and D2L, which is our learning management system. 
We are also fund, uh, refunding on a prorated basis um, housing plans, uh, rent and uh, meal plans for students who are vacating and not coming back. Um, those letters and calculations will be going out soon. It's, it's not an easy thing just to say, okay, we'll just cut everything off and send everything back. In some cases, students were not out any money themselves. They got scholarships to pay, so those things would not be refunded. Um, we also have to determine if people are coming back or not, because some of them need to, to live here. What does that mean? We are encouraging people to leave. We're asking them to leave. However, I am responsible for every student here, and in some cases, this is safer for that student than going home. In some cases, there is no home. In some cases, they're international students and they can't get back home. Some of our students are in an environment where there's not enough to eat at home and they are already on the meal plan. So in those cases, we're saying we're going to offer some support. We may not, it may not look the same. We're going to ask you to be socially responsible. That means that once people move out of the dorm, they're going to spread people out, not leave two people to a room. Uh, they're not going to have roommates. We're still going to offer a dining plan, but we're not going to have as many options of food. The students will be served instead of uh, serving themselves at at um, the dining hall, you know, like the, the salad bar. And so I'm getting detailed here, but I want you to know that almost all of our attention is how to move forward, how to serve our constituents, and that we're making all of these decisions in light of advice from the CDC with the understanding that we have a responsibility for our students and it may not just be as easy as, as an edict. We're, we're trying to make sure that we handle students as individuals. So um, as we talk about the budget, we'll have more of an idea in June of what that looks like. The governor's budget that was released Wednesday, the revised budget, um, I'm pleased to say it had some really good things in it. We, I'm, un, I'm unhappy that the Capital projects were removed, but I, frankly, I completely understand. Our state is, is looking at how to be fiscally responsible until they understand what the cost will be to the state. My hope is that if, if the uh, things look better and our, our tax receipts are, are not as down as people think they might be, that that would be put back in. Uh, and we'll certainly advocate for that. But we're, we are partnering with our state to make sure that the state handles all of our citizens and then also um, the state is dealing with the aftermath of a tornado that killed 20, 25, 26 people about a month ago. But on the good side, the uh, formula funding is still there. And so the increase that we expect because of our uh, good performance and the funding formula model is still there. And we're still hoping that that stays um, into the, to the next year. And then also, I was really concerned that the suggested 2.5% pool for increases would be gone, uh, but the governor has dialed that back to one and a half percent pool. We have to pay part of that, but the state puts in some as well. Uh, and as long as we can do that, we want to do that because we know that people are going to be struggling. We, under we understand that everything's fluid, but there, there's some good things in the budget. And so we'll, we'll give you a bigger picture in June after we have gone through this semester and see what's happening. And so, um, I'm almost through. I'm, I'm giving you more information than you may want to know, but I want to make sure that you have an understanding of our picture. I called Michael Krauss yesterday, Executive Director for CHEHEC, Tennessee Higher Education Commission, who is an Austin P grad, and said, you know, I'm just going to recommend that every institution have a couple of generals on the executive leadership team. And of, of course, on the board, that helps as well. And he laughed and he said, why? And I said, well, first of all, don't take mine, so, so don't poach mine. But General Bailey, uh, our Vice President for External Affairs, and General Brower, our military advisor in residence, have been in a situation like where I've never been in this situation, but they have. They have dealt with cities that lost their infrastructure. They've dealt with countries that lost their infrastructure. And while we have the COVID-19 task force, meeting to deal with the next few months in terms of how we get through the semester and how we start planning for summer. I asked General Bailey and General Brower to do some long range scenario planning to get us not just through the end of the semester, but what happens with um, 
middle of summer and then say for the next two years. What will happen if we are asked to completely close? What would happen if our enrollment drops? What would happen if we have an outbreak here on campus? Now, I don't think any of that's going to happen, but I don't like surprises. And so I've asked them to work with the team and then also to work with Michael Cassett to make sure they're sharing information and informing each other. But I've asked them to do some long range planning so that whatever happens, we are prepared. So I want you to know that we are not going to be taken by sur surprise. We may be with, with various um, individual bits of data, but we're going to be prepared for a lot of eventualities to make sure that we are financially responsible and that we are following our mission. And so I'm, I'm really pleased about that. And I want to just say thank you also to our faculty and staff who are doing incredible work on behalf of the students. I'm so proud of them, and, and I have to say, I'm so proud of our students. They are disappointed, but almost to a one, they're saying, I'm going to do everything I can to get through. I understand there's been a disruption. What can I do to help? And so our students have been incredible in this time when they're really struggling to figure out how to, how to move forward in their own lives. Thank you to the trustees for being willing to try this, um, not just this new uh, way to do the board meeting in, in an emergency situation, but I called all of you when we made that decision to move from face-to-face um, -face instruction to something else, and every one of you said, I understand, what can I do? You have my, my support and my, back, uh, my back, backing. You have my back, so thank you for that. And thank you for the grace that you've given us. And I'll just say to, to end, I am an optimist. And I say that all the time, but I really am. Um, and it's because I believe in people. I also believe in what we're doing. I believe in the value of education. And I believe in future and I believe in hope. And I believe in relationships. And so I just pledge to you that we will serve our students and our faculty and staff and our community in a way that brings value to them and that makes you proud. And so that's uh, the, the conclusion of my remarks. And if you have any questions on the State Building uh, Commission actions and contracts or any interim items, they're in your notebook and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, there. Chairman O'Malley. We may have you muted. There we go. He's still muted. There you go. Chairman O'Malley. Can you hear me okay? I can now, thank you. Uh, well, I guess there's some feedback. Try it again. I need to see on the cell phone. Yeah, the cell phone. Try, well, we're going to unmute your cell phone. Try that. Are you there? Chairman? Try it again. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, but still so. Well, you can't mute the phone. Um, phone's unmuted. Yeah, you can't It's the second. Well, we're working on it, sir. Hang on. What do we need to do? Okay, we're gonna we're going to unmute your phone, but mute your computer. That's the one right there. Yeah. Okay, Chairman. Can you hear me now? Right. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sorry. Not like you have to hear me, but you know we're, we're at the tail end. So, uh, uh, thank you so much for your terrific remarks and for your report. It's it's uh, challenging enough to run a large university like Austin P uh, when things are, are normal. And it's obviously things are far from normal now. And thank you for your leadership, the leadership of your team. Um, and we will, I agree with you, I'm an optimist too. We will get through this and be better uh, as we get up on the other side of it. Um, 
Are there any additional comments or questions before we adjourn? I'd love to, to say thank you for our student trustee participation. Uh, Stacy has been an amazing partner. Um, it's, been a, it's been a thrill to work with her this year. I, I agree, and I would say to Stacy as well, thank you for your service to the board. You've been a terrific representative of the student body this past year, Stacy. I think your wisdom, your participation, the insights that you've had have all made us a better board. And so congratulations, thank you, and best of luck going forward. Um, and finally, before we officially adjourn, um, let me echo Dr. White's thank yous to the team there, certainly Danelle, McCartney, Bill, and the IT team. Um, you guys have, this has gone off pretty seamlessly and is a, has been a good way to, to go about holding the board meeting. I think. Uh, also like to thank, I'd love to be able to shake his hand, but uh, maybe down the road, uh, Dr. Gandhi for uh, all he's done for the university and what he will continue to do for the university. Um, as a reminder, our next regularly scheduled meeting will be June 4 and 5, 2020. Hopefully we're all back in the room. Um, and with that, I move that the meeting adjourn. Is there a second? Second. It is moved and seconded that the meeting adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the ayes have it and the meeting is adjourned.